First, let me talk about uh, wisdom in general and the, the sapiential language, as it were, sapiential cultures. It's been said that in the old days, before a certain, uh, certain age arrived, that all of humanity had a sapiential consciousness. I think this is true insofar as people had a kind of a mythical understanding. They didn't uh, look at things with hard outlines and scientific precision the way we tend to nowadays, but they looked at things as it were, as if they were all one and as if there was a common life animating everything. And then gradually we become smarter and smarter and at the same time less and less wise in the, in the sense of a, of a comprehensive understanding and a participatory understanding. Here's a quote from uh, Aldous Huxley, Huxley in the introduction to his book, The Perennial Philosophy. The metaphysic that recognizes a divine reality substantial to the world of things, that would mean basic or the ground of the world of things, or the all within which the world of things is contained and lives and minds, the psychology that finds in the soul something similar to or even identical with the divine reality, the ethic that places our final end in the knowledge of the imminent and transcendent ground of all being. The thing, he says, the thing itself, not the expression, is immemorial and universal. So he says it's universal and it's always been there. So uh, that's a pretty strong affirmation. Let me just read you a few, kind of a grab bag of uh, short sapiential assertions. Here's Kabir. Behold but one in all things. It is the second that leads you astray. Here's Eckhart. To gauge the soul, one must gauge it with God, for the ground of God and the ground of the soul are one and the same. Here's Rice Brook, almost a contemporary of Eckhart, Western Christian. The spirit possesses God essentially in naked nature, and God the spirit. Here's Philo, the Jewish uh, sort of Jewish Hellenistic uh, philosopher. The farther one goes, the farther one travels, the less one knows. And here's Rumi. Everybody knows Rumi. Sell your cleverness and buy bewilderment. Cleverness is mere opinion. Bewilderment is intuition. And here's Beat Griffiths. Here's a Westerner who became an Easterner, who traveled to India and tried to achieve a marriage of East and West in the form of a, an interreligious dialogue and conversation and kind of convergence between Hindu Vedanta particularly and Christianity. It is the ground of consciousness just as it is the ground of existence. It is that from which all thing, all thought springs, but which cannot be thought. Yet there is a point beyond thought where this becomes known, not as an object of thought, once again we run into that non-objective knowledge, nor yet as even a subject as distinct from an object, but an identity of subject and object, of being and knowing. This is the experience of the self, with a capital S, the Atman, beyond, beyond being insofar as being is an object of thought, beyond thought insofar as thought is a reflection or a concept of being. It is pure awareness of being, pure delight in being, Sachi Dananda, that is being, knowledge and bliss. It is Nirvana, the ultimate state, the supreme wisdom, beyond which it is impossible to go. And just uh, from the other end of time, here's Wallace Stevens. The poem refreshes life so that we share for a moment the first idea. It satisfies belief in an immaculate beginning. The first idea, the immaculate beginning. You can, you can uh, taste the sapiential tradition there.
What is this wisdom then that we're talking about? We already know what it is. If we're familiar with the liturgy of the hours of the, uh, the Catholic tradition, we've had a lot of uh, experiences of it because those readings are full of it. It's a particular kind of knowing, we call it a participatory knowing. That participation is a very important reality, a very important way of knowing, which we have largely forgotten in the modern world because our standard way of understanding is the scientific way, which is purely objective. So you can uh, see an exact contrast and opposition almost between objective knowing by which you know something by being outside of it, standing outside of it and looking at it, and participatory knowing in which you know something by experiencing it from within inside. Somehow, somehow you and what you're looking at, what you're experiencing, uh, penetrate one another. So that the knowing is a knowing in sameness. So this is an experiential knowing, a loving knowledge, as the medieval mystics would like to say. There's knowing and there's loving. There's the, you might say, there's the mind and there's the soul. But there are times when the mind and the soul somehow know as one, when we experience things in that double way. And it's more than a double way, because in a sense, the whole of the human person is drawn into this way of knowing. And that kind of knowing, in the spiritual, on the spiritual level, the religious level, culminates in a kind of union, the divine mystical union. This knowing is affirmative also. Uh, you know, faith is our fundamental way of knowing, isn't it, in Christianity? But faith relies on, on the Word of God, relies on the Scriptures. But it's an affirmation. Knowing is only, if it's a knowing in love, it's also a knowing in affirmation. In other words, the whole of our being reaches forward towards this which we know. So the, know, the knowing is never just knowing, as it would be in science. But it's a knowing which is both participatory and also in movement. Our being somehow is moving towards. This knowledge is also, uh, can be a created knowing. In other words, in sense, we participate in, in giving birth to what we know in this way. But it, it creates a certain mental field. It, 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 like poetry, you know? because the sapiential is really the poetry, say, of Christianity, or the poetry of Buddhism, or the poetry of Hinduism. It's a speech which is not only to render facts, to communicate, say, ordinary reality, empirical reality, factual reality, but to touch the person at the same time and, and start something, to initiate something, as it were, a light a fire or a spark or something like that within the person, okay? which then is already a participation in what's being talked about in the, in the material itself, in the literature itself, or in the speaking itself. So it has that, that power of poetry to penetrate and to, as it were, create a life of its own within the person, which turns out to be the person's own life, but maybe open to depths or to breadths that it hasn't yet experienced. The way that that language and that that whole, whatever it is that gets into that kind of thinking, that kind of talking, the way it reaches the whole person, and tends to set up a kind of, what do you call it, gravitational field within the person that draws them towards their center. The taste of it is very much like the taste of poetry. That is poetry which has a profundity to it, poetry which, which really beneath its surface has something deep and alive going on, okay, that is able to expand the person and deepen the person as they, as they taste it, as they read it. But it draws you into it like, uh, what would you call it, with a certain sweetness. Often the, the old writers would talk about sweetness, especially in the Middle Ages, you know, the sweetness of the scriptures, of the New Testament, of the gospel, of the parables, of, of what Jesus would say and what Jesus would do, and of the uh, ancient sapiential literature as well. So taste is a good word for it. We could speak of fragrance, um, 
Mm-hmm. We could speak of the sound music of it. We could speak of the, uh, the images that it conveys, even visual images. But somehow, taste says it best, I think, because of its intimacy, for one thing. Okay? Because what, what you taste, you're taking into yourself. You're absorbing. It's becoming you. Okay? And when you say it, it's interesting that it has a kind of a theological resonance in that we think of God communicating God's self into this world through word and spirit, okay? So there's a word, and there's a biblical word, and then there's the spirit. And very special is the place where the word and the spirit meet, where the, the word is not just word, but it's word and spirit. So it's word with life, it's word with energy, it's word with love in it, okay? And that's what we're talking about when we talk about the scriptural language and especially the sapiential language. It's not just word, it's not just concept by any means, okay? You could say that it has flesh and blood. You can also say that it has both word and spirit, okay? Or that it has both truth and goodness, or whatever you like. But it, all of those expressions, those dualities, are simply in trying to express the totality of the human person, that it touches and engages, okay? As food does. So coming back to that taste sense, Taste is appropriate for this, and taste is appropriate perhaps in another way for the Eucharist. That is the experience of Christ that one may have in the Eucharist. When you consume the Eucharist, the Eucharist is consuming you in some way. In other words, Christ is absorbing you as well as you're absorbing Christ. And that's true of the sapiential and sapiential material. It uh, gives you a taste, and at the same time, it's as if it's tasting you. It's as if it's somehow assimilating you. So that's the participatory kind of of knowing that we were talking about. Let's move on into the Christian tradition, starting with the New Testament itself. Now here are uh, a couple of parables from chapter 13 of St. Matthew's Gospel, okay? The parable is a form of sapiential discourse. It's a form of wisdom teaching. And you'll notice that it's got an openness of interpretation. In other words, it doesn't explain itself in literal language that you can pin down, but leaves it up to you, as it were, to imagine, to create somehow by getting into the, into the core of the thing, into the heart of the parable to participate in its meaning. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make their nests in its branches. And then there's a twin parable here. Often in the the Gospels, you'll find a parable featuring a male character and then a parable with a woman in it. He told him another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and sowed in uh, three measures of flour until it was all all leaven. Notice the kind of parallel or analogy between the two, of the minute quantity of something and then the immense, almost uh, almost measure, immeasurable uh, magnitude to which it springs. Here's a quite different sapiential uh, language or style. It's from Paul's letter to the Colossians in the first chapter. Speaking of Jesus, of course. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities. Those are all ranks of angels, according to the old tradition. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, so that everything might, in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, 
whether on, in, uh, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So that's a strong and very synthetic expression of the mystery of Christ. On the third day there was a marriage at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the marriage with his disciples. So there you've got a man and a woman, but they're not the bridegroom and the bride of the, uh, of the wedding at Cana itself. But you can suspect that always in John there's always another lab, a level of meaning traveling underneath the literal sense. When the wine failed, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, O oh woman, what have you to do with me? And that's a way, according to the usual translation or understanding, that's a way of saying, uh, what business of this is mine, or what business of this is ours? Um, but it's curious, the way that it's expressed, what have you to do with me? It's almost like the hour of another wedding has not yet come, when he says, my hour has not yet come. The hour that has not yet come is the hour of his death and resurrection, of course. It's the hour towards which his whole, whole life is moving. Now, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. There's a, a good Jewish mother who has managed somehow to get, to, get around the son's objections and, and uh, achieve what she wants. Six stone water jars were standing there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. Then he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the steward of the feast. So they, uh, so they took it. When the steward of the feast tasted the wa water now become wine, he did not know where it came from, but though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone saves the, serves the, the good wine first. And then when people have drunk freely, they, they give the poor wine, but you have kept the, the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and has dis manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The first of his signs. So it's going to have a special value, a special meaning. It's been said that uh, in, this, in this story of the wedding feast at Cana and changing the water into wine by Jesus is the whole of John's gospel in some way. And I believe that that's true, but you can almost say that of every one of Jesus' signs, that each one of them somehow is a doorway into the whole, the whole meaning of the gospel. The feast, the wedding, and the miracle, the, the changing of the water into wine, all somehow converge. Each one of them has a kind of symbolic mean, meaning, and they all come together because a wedding is a unifying thing. A wedding is a unitive thing. The ultimate wedding here, I think, is the wedding of, of God and creation. In other words, the the final, the final wedding, about which all of the New Testament is concerned. So, uh, the wedding feast of Cana is the anticipation of this great sign at the end, which is ultimately the, the new creation. And notice anticipation. I think a woman in John's Gospel is always anticipating and in some way, what we say, initiating something. And so it is with Mary here. She anticipates, and Jesus says, not my hour yet, but it directly foretells his hour. It directly translates his hour into another language, the hour of his death, and particularly his resurrection, when the water of human life will be changed into the wine of divine human life, or when Jesus appears to the disciples who are gathered in the room with the doors closed for fear of the Jews, remember? And he appears to them, and he says, uh, peace be with you. And, of course, they're... They're staggered and they're ecstatic in their joy because they really didn't totally believe that he had risen from the dead. And what does he do? He breathes upon them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. Whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. Breathes upon them. Do you know what that recalls? Do you remember something in the first chapter of Genesis where God breathed the spirit of life into Adam, into the first man, and he became a living being. So what this is, is a second creation. Second creation, first of all, of the human being, and then through the human being, everything else, as Paul says in, in chapter 8 of his letter to the Romans.
Now there's another scene elsewhere in, in the New Testament. It's in the Acts of the Apostles, the second chapter, and it's the story of the day of Pentecost, do you remember? When uh, the disciples were in the upper room, and I think the doors were still closed probably out of their fear of some kind of uh, persecution from the Jewish authorities. And then the Holy Spirit uh, fills the room, and there's a sound like a mighty wind, and the apostles are filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to speak in other tongues. And they come tumbling out of that upper room, and then some of the bystanders say, well, they're, they're drunk with new wine. You know, they're filled with new wine. And, and it's true. It's true. That's the real new wine. It's the Holy Spirit, which is the very Spirit of God, which is the very being of God. And the drunkenness that they're talking about or that they're accusing them of is a, a kind of, it's a parallel to drunkenness. It's almost a comic, uh, what would you call it, comic rapport or relationship between ordinary drunkenness and this drunkenness, which is sort of a largeness beyond your normal being, beyond your normal, beyond the level of normal human capacities. And so it goes sideways in these various tongues. They've got tongues of fire sitting on their heads and they're speaking all these strange languages. It's as if they're, they're suddenly uh, polylingual, as if they suddenly know all languages. And that's symbolic, actually, of the spread of of uh, the gospel and of Christianity to the ends of the earth, to all the peoples in those strange tongues, which are real tongues because the people that are listening, many of them come from different nationalities, different different peoples of, with, of different languages, and they hear them speaking in their own tongues. So it's symbolical of, of the end. We can think of uh, our present kind of global threshold and, and Rana's idea of the Second Vatican Council as the first council of a world church in which the different cultures, the different tongues, the different peoples are truly expressed in their own way, and Christianity becomes a multiple, a multiple reality which is yet one in the unity of the Spirit, and the unity of its center, which is Christ. So that's pretty powerful. Uh, and this, of course, relates to what? Well, let me recall the words of John the Baptist first. Remember, he said, uh, it's right after the prologue of John, early in the first chapter of John's Gospel. And Jesus is uh, pointing out Jesus, uh, John is pointing out Jesus is the Lamb of God. And this is the one on whom I saw the Spirit descend on a dove and remain. The one who sent me, this is God, the one who sent me to baptize with water, told me that he on whom you see the Holy Spirit descend and remain, he is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So we move from a baptism in water to a baptism in the Holy Spirit. And this is precisely what is happening at the end of John's Gospel with the inbreathing of the Spirit and then the other version, Luke's version, in the Acts of the Apostles of Pentecost Day when the disciples being filled with the Spirit. And notice the two, uh, the two Pentecosts, as it were. John's Pentecost is like an interior reality, which brings about an interior transformation. Whereas the Luke's version in Acts is, is like an outward explosion, which is moving almost in the opposite direction, but those two directions, the outward and the inward, as it were, the, the <clears throat> penetration of the two barriers, the barrier between the human person and God, the inward opening and transformation and liberation, and the, the breaking through the barrier between Jews and Gentiles, between the people of God who had the word of God in the Old Testament and all of the peoples of the earth, both of those are broken through, an implosion and an exclusion, as it were. It beautifully somehow communicates the meaning of the, of the event of Christ, which is in between the two. It may seem like this is a kind of archaeological expedition to go back to the tradition of that kind of knowing in Christianity, but actually I think there's a key to the future in it. If we don't recover that, what would you call it, holistic or that total personal way of knowing, our knowledge will remain rather flat, and our religion will remain rather flat too, and our understanding of the scriptures 
because uh, the sapiential way of writing somehow puts an experience inside the account, inside the narrative, or inside the, the statement, whatever it is, so the whole of you gets moved by it. Now we're going to be proceeding in four movements, and this is the first of them. The first movement is the sapiential awakening of the 20th century. That is the, the, uh, the big one just behind us, which continues. We're still in this process. The reawakening to a wisdom consciousness itself, a sapiential consciousness. A consciousness which is participative, and which has the dimension of depth, and which is not objective, but somehow moves within. Not knowing things from the outside, but knowing things from the inside as you move deeper and deeper within yourself. The second one is what I've called the Eastern turn, and that is the uh, attention given to the Asian traditions. They have been of great influence and in some way have been a necessary phase, I think, in the opening up of Christianity itself to its core, to its heart, and to its full potential. The realization of the oneness at the core of our being, which is not other than the oneness that is God. And it's as if when we are attracted to the Eastern traditions, I'm talking about Hinduism, especially Hindu Vedanta, and Buddhism, especially I suppose Zen Buddhism, because it's the, the best known in the West, and about Taoism as well. Those three great traditions um, when we are, feel the attraction towards them, to go deeper into them and to begin the practice and to try to experience that which we feel in their scriptures, what we're heading for, I think, what we want is initiation, is a spiritual initiation. In other words, we've probably been fed on the, what would you call it, fed on the rational and emotional uh, foods of the West for a long time and have been some way uh, educated away from spirit, educated away from that interior dimension, you might call it a vertical dimension, of kind of uh, intuition beyond knowing, or knowing beyond knowing, or learned ignorance, whatever you want to call it, but we've been, uh, we've been carried away from it by the whole movement of our culture in the last five centuries or so. So we look east for it, and as a matter of fact, east seems to be the, what would you call it, the preferred residence, the preferred uh, planting ground and field of that kind of knowledge, of that kind of experience, experience of spirit. The Western turn is not towards spirit, it's, it's as it were, from the experience of spirit into history. As if we migrated, as if we changed our orientation, what would you say, 90 degrees, all right, from the uh, ascending vertical movement to a horizontal movement into history. And somehow discovering transcendence within history, that's characteristic of the West, I think. And we have to ask what's happening in history underneath all of that underneath all the negatives, and underneath the positive benefits of the West, things like democracy, things like respect for human rights, what's happening underneath? Is something happening in history there, and is that something a product of the Christ event? Okay. We come back to the question of what did Christ bring into the world? What is there that's new that wasn't here before he came? And I think we're going to find it manifested in the modern West. That history in the West has taken on a new depth and fullness, a new power, and a new profundity in the event of Christ. So in the West we find human transcendence, that is the movement of the spirit towards God, somehow embodying itself, incarnating itself in historical movement. And hence it looks, when you look at history often, it looks as if the West invented history. Now it didn't. It didn't. But in a sense it, it produced, it created, it lived, a new kind of history, a kind of history in which the divine is embodied in the human, an incarnational history, which 
begins with Jesus Christ, doesn't it? It begins with the actual historical incarnation and then proceeds and creates, begins to create a new world as well as a new history, which will be rather confusing, rather difficult to see, partly because there's still so much in it. But to turn to the West and the recovery of the values of the West and somehow a penetrating of the confusing and wild surface of the West to feel its pulse, to find out what the inner movement is there, which we can't escape really because we're part of it. We've got it in our blood, even when we try to leave it behind, even when we dislike it, even when we, what would you call, try to detach ourselves from it, we still live by it. We're still full of it. So we have to come to, what would you say, come to terms with that sooner or later. That's a coming home. But each of these movements actually is a coming home in some way. The sapiential awakening is a coming home to our own interior and to the language that the language that can express somehow, can put into words and put it to the human heart, that experience, that interior experience. The turn to the east is the quest of spirit, which is the, you might say, the profundity or the peak, if you wish, of that kind of knowing, of that interior kind of knowing. The turn towards the west is a coming home because that's where we start. We start with the motion of the west, almost you might say with the music of the west in our veins. And so sooner or later we have to come back to that. And we have to try to find what's really inside it rather than just sort of grazing on its surface as we may have done in our earlier life. And then finally, the global turn. And the global turn is something that confronts us all the time. We talk about globalization, we hear a lot about it. And perhaps it is the major historical movement of our time. It's been happening for at least 500 years. Happening, it's interesting, but it happens under the initiative of the West. Notice that the, the bringing of the world together, the drawing of the world together, the crossing of boundaries, the acquainting of one person, of one uh, culture, one people with other peoples, is, comes from the Western initiative. Starts from the Western side and then becomes somehow reciprocal and universal been going on for a long time. But it's almost as if, in our time, the human arms reached around the world and joined hands on the other side in some way, so that globalization becomes almost like an event of our time. Think of, uh, think of two world wars. I, I don't know if wars were ever called world wars before the 20th century, but there they are. Why were they called world wars? Because somehow the whole world was pulled together, or much of it, or most of it, was pulled together into the conflict. Conflict was a European conflict in both cases. And when the whole Western project was put in question for the first time, you can say in a way that postmodernism started then. Postmodernism started after the First World War, or about then, all right? When the West was really put in question. It was a Teilhard that said that those two world wars would seem to split humanity, would seem to divide it and separate human beings, but instead it brought them together. Instead, those wars brought the world together somehow. I remember, I think it was Robert Mueller, the United Nations man who, uh, when the United States decided to invade Iraq, the whole world became mobilized somehow, almost, against that, against that aggressive move. Mueller said, this is wonderful. People said, you're crazy. You mean this, uh, this uh, illegal, unjust, unprovoked invasion is great? He said, yes, because the world has never united itself behind something as firmly and as completely before as it has against this war. That's typical of the age of globalization, or as Teilhard would call it, planetization. When I say Teilhard, of course, I mean Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, the French Jesuit and scientist of the 20th century, who was, I think, a kind of singular prophet, all by himself almost, it seems in extending, you might say, sapiential theology into the future with the help of science, with the help of evolutionary science. To find a global consciousness, to be able to think as if we were thinking as part of the whole, to be able to think as a cell in that great body of humanity. Okay? So we're only beginning to confront that.